Last year we seized um, 142 clan labs in Victoria. That was up um, 42 labs from the previous year. The chemicals used are highly toxic, and particularly if they're cooking in confined spaces or at a home. Crystal methamphetamine is the number one drug of choice for the young in Australia today. Known as ICE, it is so powerful, it takes just one hit for users to become addicted. Today, authorities are warning of what they call an ICE epidemic. Police, open the door! Where is the witch? They're dead! We're seeing some real increases in violent crime and even murders or homicide from people that are addicted to or under the influence of ICE. Rising crime rates are the tip of the iceberg. Major drug producers the world over see Australia as a lucrative market, where one gram of ice has a street value of $1,000 and is good for 10 hits. But the real cost, countless families destroyed every day. It took away my ability to love my own children. I have no doubt that I would turn my back on my family again. I'm Chan Tao Cho. This week, 101 East enters the world of meth abuse and addiction. We ask, can Australia overcome this ice crisis? Australia is facing a new and frightening epidemic, an alarming spike in methamphetamine abuse, especially among teenagers and young adults. Last year, ambulance call-outs to ICE users tripled from 2011. In the state of Victoria alone, 14 murders in the past 14 months have been linked to meth-related crimes. Paramedics like Michael Whelan are on the front line of ICE rage. We've had a, a rapid increase in paramedics being assaulted um, from, from aggressive and violent patients. We're here to, to provide um, care to, to the sick and injured, um, but our goal is to also get home at the end of the night. We rely on the police for protection. Someone's going to end up being killed um, by, by someone who's out of control. Um, so that's my biggest concern, that my colleagues are, are going to face this danger increasingly in the back of an ambulance. <laughs> This is where he went into convulsions. Awareness campaigns urge people against trying crystal meth even I mean, once. They're pretty cool. The drug causes users to experience an extreme high for days without yeah. sleep, followed by paranoia, psychosis and rage as they come down. Let me in! Let me in! Let me in! I'm gonna kill you! So what happens when they get here? When they get here, they're assessed by uh, one of the triage nurses or doctors, mm -hmm. and then depending on how unwell they are, they're often put in a cubicle where they're not going to produce any harm to themselves or harm to other members of the staff in the emergency department. Dr. Sean Green works in the emergency department of Austin Hospital, one of the busiest in Melbourne. How's the day been? Uh, it's been very good. A few long stays, a little bit of access, but it's actually been looking pretty good. I think we'll be fine. Ready for the rush this afternoon, no doubt. Yeah, um, no doubt it'll be busy. All right, good on you, mate. Okay, thanks, Simon. He says patients with alcohol-related problems far outweigh those suffering meth abuse. But meth aggression is much more dangerous. We have uh, enough people to have one person on each limb and one person looking after the head. So we have at least five staff for safe you need that restraint. many people to handle one and patient? Often, and often it's more than that when people are very agitated from methamphetamine. Right. Prolonged use destroys a person. AmericasRehabs.com recently posted this video showing the changing face of a meth user over 10 years. Now you build tolerance, so you need more and more methamphetamine each time you take it and so you need increasing doses to get the euphoria. 
They can cause heart attacks, they can cause bleeding in the brain, they can cause strokes. Some people die just because they get such a high body temperature that they can't cope with. Methamphetamines have effects on some areas of the brain that control movement and they produce what we call stereotypical effects, which means that the, the movement is repetitive. The picking of the skin, the grinding of the teeth, which is known as bruxism. Sometimes they can have thoughts of harming others or harming themselves. Sometimes they have seizures. Uh, they can be confused. Totally in another world, I couldn't get through to him. Almost violent to me a couple of times, you know, like where he punched a few walls and we had serious arguments. Former Australian boxer Barry Michael never expected his toughest fight to come long after his retirement. But in a two-year battle against his son's meth addiction, the former super featherweight world champion felt like he had to punch way above his weight. With his son Zach twice arrested for ice possession, Barry was on the ropes until a few months ago. The penny dropped with him after one of his uh, very good friends committed suicide and he saw the change in so many people. At the start it was a, a party drug, they'd go out and in the end they'd just go to each other's houses just to do it and they'd be doing it continually and you'd find yourself up for you know, a week at a time without virtually any sleep and then you're absolutely exhausted. Today, Barry is keeping Zach on the straight and narrow, the best way he knows how. He wants to see his once athletic son become fighting fit again. A lot of the time, it's just more of a mental, mental battle with yourself. 25-year-old Zach has been clean for six months and dropped 10 kilos. You're puffing, you're tired, or you know you want to give up, but you you keep pushing through. He's talking not just about his training regime, but also his drug recovery. Getting arrested, he says, was no help. They kind of, you know, expect you to go out and change your ways the mo moment you walk out of the police station, which is you know, completely ludicrous. I was, first thing I did was, you know, call up my mates and go back and meet up with them, and I was smoking again, you know, half an hour later. There should be some sort of, um, you know, testing strategy implemented the moment you leave the police station so that you are forced to be clean because a lot of people don't actually have the strength to do it themselves like if but if you're forced to have you know two drug tests a week with a hook and roll out. give them that for six months that's going to help people stop people from reoffending. it's more of my generation's kind of epidemic like anyone my age or a few years below me everyone's pretty much using it these days it's just it's just that socially accepted the social acceptance fuels a lucrative market for an underground trade. Zach became a part of it, spending $1,000 a week on ice. You're talking about the huge criminal underworld, like, you know, the sort of stuff you see in movies, like kidnappings, murders, you know, all sorts of stuff, like holding people hostage. they got people, you know, like, cooking this stuff for them, like, you know, against their will. With 1,500 members, the Rebels is Australia's largest outlaw motorcycle gang operating in every state and territory. Australian news reports show rising concern over outlaw bikey gangs flooding the country with drugs. Police arrived at the clubhouse expecting to find drugs and ammunition and they weren't disappointed. Two Sydney teenagers are facing possible charges after international gangs allegedly recruited them to work as drug mules. International drug syndicates are getting more inventive. In February, customs officers found 180 kilos of ice hidden in this consignment of kayaks from China. That's just a fraction of nearly 1,600 kilos of meth shipments they've seized since last year. The total street value, more than 1.2 billion US dollars. Police open the door! In March, police raided this and more than 40 other houses, busting a Middle Eastern gang involved in trafficking firearms, ice and other drugs. Place your hands behind your back. We're actually being targeted by international syndicates from um, China, from Canada, from South America. They might uh, engage uh, local um, cooks to um, 
uh, manufacture the product. Um, but others are also bringing the final product in and linking into established drug networks. It might be um, you know, outlaw motorcycle gangs or other groups, Middle Eastern crime gangs, to actually distribute their products. So they make the drug, they sell the drug, they um, provide it to underages. They sell the drug as another drug. I meet a recently convicted ICE dealer for a bikey gang. He's trying to free himself from their clutches to protect his identity. We'll call him Tom. Tom narrowly escaped prison for a range of drug offences, but must do rehab and community service. He says the average user buys 0.1 grams of ice to last a week. Until his arrest, Tom was smoking a gram a day. He says his slippery slope began two years ago when gang members enticed him and his housemates with free ice. Lots of it, like there was grams and grams sitting around me all the time. And it was just go for your life, smoke as much as you want. You get addicted to the drug and rely on the drug. And then all of a sudden it becomes, you have to pay for it. And I didn't have money, so they pretty much said, well, as long as I'm smoking, if I can provide other people with the drug as well. So that way you became a dealer. I didn't really have a choice to stop because if I didn't deal, I had to find money to pay for what I'd already smoked, which I didn't know I had to do in the first place. What is the hardest part about trying to cut off ties with the people who were supplying you? When I was in debt, they took photos of my ID. Um, I've had threats against my family, against their property. The hardest part about trying to stop now is um, constantly get phone calls from dealers saying that they want to give me the drug. In the depths of despair, Tom is reaching out to his parents for help. He hasn't been home for a year after his father kicked him out for stealing from them to pay his drug debts. I meet his mother, we'll call her Ginny. She's heartbroken by how ICE has destroyed her family, leaving her caught between her husband and son. Because I was protecting my son and my husband didn't understand it. I didn't either, but I had to be there for him. He had no one else. And I have to keep it all together. If I fall down, everyone will fall down. So I have to be strong. Realising she couldn't do it alone, Ginny wrote to a social worker. Hi Les, my son is 19 years old and my husband and I adopted him and his brother. He was three and a half when he came to us and was an adorable child whom I loved to death. As he was reaching his teens, my husband and... She's writing to Les Twentyman, who has more than 30 years' experience working with troubled youth. They arranged to meet. It was heroin, you know, but now it's methamphetamine. And the sad thing about it is that um, it's filling our prisons up, you know. I mean, I had a petrol bomb thrown at me uh, two years ago by a woman. Les and Ginny agree Tom urgently needs to move out of the house he shares with other meth users. Ginny is trying to find her son other accommodation. Until then, she has to persuade her husband to let Tom move back home. But given their rocky relationship, she doesn't know if he'll say yes. The thing with uh, meth is it's been sort of pedal to the young people that it's going to improve their um, energy levels, their sexual ability and all sorts of stuff. Les Twentyman believes young people like Tom could have been stopped from turning to ICE. He wants the government to dedicate more resources to put youth workers in schools. The evidence we've got is that kids that are, who have fractured educations or early ex exiting education are the ones that are more likely to fall into the path of drugs. If you haven't got a youth worker to make that contact with the kid in the first place, how's that kid, kid going to access all those uh, programs and projects? His organisation, 20th Men Fund, runs a successful basketball program for vulnerable kids, keeping them off the streets and high on sport. We've got coaches here that are off the rails when they're 15, now they're 23 and they're at university and they're working part-time for our fund. You know, that's where you see the successes. Children I know have been in families where there's been ice addicted parents, um, suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder because of the violence 
because of uh, the irregularity of their life and what we try to do in substituting is to have them involved in a range of uh, sporting and recreation and drama activities that fill that, that isolation out of pack it up and, and get some disciplines and structures into their life. Yeah. These kids are very much at risk of falling into the crutches of drug cartels. A few days later, I received good news. Tom's father has agreed to let him come home after meeting him for the first time in a year. We find Tom packing up, preparing to leave this toxic environment behind. His housemates let us film in his room, on the condition that we don't identify the house. Quite nervous and daunting, just to face housemates and all that sort of thing. Why are you feeling nervous and daunting? The confrontation between me and my housemates, whether they've got to cause trouble or not. And you haven't been home for a year, so how's that going to be like? Yeah, it's, that's another daunting one between me and my dad. Me and dad used to always fight, so now that I'm more on the good side and clean side, it's, um, it's good, whereas me and dad are starting to talk, get along again. It's just a mess. Yeah, total mess. It's good to clean up, isn't it? Yep. It's exciting. The beginning of a new ice age kick-started a state inquiry late last year in Victoria. Investigations reveal ice problems found in the city are magnified in regional country towns. We travel to the Goulburn Valley, two hours drive north of Melbourne. It is known as Australia's food bowl for its high agricultural output, but the inquiry found entire communities in decay. Gangs plying the feel-good drug target these areas, exploiting despair from unemployment and lack of access to help and services. There was not one person that hadn't tried it, from the 12-year-old kids to the 60-year-old men. Recovering ice addict Morgan Gascoigne lives in the town of Euroa, home to 3,000 residents. He says he's been clean for six months after five times in jail for stealing and break-ins to feed his addiction. As soon as they started getting on all the ice and I guess some kid went and found it in Melbourne, it literally was like, like the plague around the town. Morgan has to travel an hour to seek treatment at this medical centre which looks after hardcore drug addicts. With him today is Bjorn Delphin, who has been clean for three months after a decade of abusing ice and other drugs. They are both here to see drug counsellor Lynn McDougall. When I first got on it, it was like hard to get. Like it was, it was very rare. You know, you you take hours to get it. But now it's kind of pushed on you. Like people coming up to you, like putting it in your face. Both men are at a critical point of their recovery. As Lynn knows, their resistance is far from foolproof. I hadn't felt this way in like eight years. I kind of gave up on love. I didn't think I'd ever find love again. And I was distracting myself slowly with drugs and alcohol. And, but now that I've found love, I've um, got engaged and, and it's changed my life around. This new relationship you've got, if, if that were, heaven forbid, to fall over, do you think you're strong enough to move, keep moving forward? Probably not at this point. And, um, I think I've still got a fair way to go to, yeah. to be rid of it forever. You mentioned before that boredom is your biggest trigger. Yeah, I pretty much have to keep looking back on why I was in jail and all, all, all the things that I've done. And I've put little things in perspective, like I've gone out and I've bought myself a weight set. I'm now doing my junior football and all that sort of stuff again. Me and my little brother go to the gym. And I've just having to, having to be and put these little things in play, so I keep um, not bored. I've been doing a fair bit of community work. They say the temptation to relapse is multiplied, living in small towns where it's hard to cut ties with ice users and sellers. I've been isolating myself, but you, in the end, you got to start surrounding yourself around yeah. it again. Because yeah. you live in, you you both live in small towns. Yeah, you can't escape it. It's everywhere. Morgan keeps himself busy by upgrading parts of his old car. He has also enrolled in a course to become a youth worker. I just sort of want to help people like me. I'd rather hear it from someone who's done it. That was always, that was always my thing, so I'd just like to give him my perspective and hopefully I can help a few people. Bjorn, where to for you? Um, hopefully marriage. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, and we're planning to move out of this town so we, as well, so... 
Okay, Hopefully so in the next few months, so we won't be here as well. So cut those ties completely from this environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. Hopefully, you'll, down the track, I'll be get back to work, which I haven't worked for a while. Excellent. They all sound like fantastic steps forward. My first suggestion is to come along to a 12-step meeting and... Back in Melbourne, I meet with meth addicts of an anonymous support group run by Stuart Fenton, a drug and alcohol counsellor. They're at different stages of recovery and emotions are raw. I hate groups, um, self-consciousness, and I only came in because I was on fire. You know, at times it can seem like putting a band-aid on a gape and axe wound in the neck, you know. Having a sponsor or a mentor... Stuart, a former addict himself, believes in a 12-step program that fights substance dependency. It has helped him stay clean for 11 years. Society sees it as bad people, but it's not. It's just un unwell people. So, you know, After weeks of asking the group to meet me, I was told to prepare for eight people, but not to expect all to turn up. It is something Stuart deals with every week. So the most vulnerable might not return the next week, and you see empty chairs. Even though I, I've, ad I've adjusted to it, there's still a sadness with it, you know, and I have a, I have a good friend who I've known for a number of years who, who after six years of recovery went back to it and is, and is there now, and, I, and it, there's grief there. Stewart wants them to stay vigilant against relapse by seeing addiction as an illness that needs constant treatment. The, the idea that at some point I'll be cured, for me right now, doesn't apply to me at all. You know, like, if that was the case, the first thing I would do would be go and use crystal meth. Or what would be your triggers? Becoming conscious in the morning after a night's sleep was a trigger. Relapse prevention or, or looking at triggers never did anything for me. You know, like I was always going to use, again. Until there's, a, you know, a, a complete shift in that thinking and attitude, um, your guess on the trigger is as good as mine. What's the worst thing a relapse can do? People die. Often. I was thinking there's worse things than dying. Like yeah. what? Um, prostitution for me, crime, waking up every morning and the shame and the guilt. I went to prison for 10 years. Um, you know, and, and you can only really inter intervene when, you know, the, the person's in a, a critical state or, you know, that they respond to, to help, you know, and... Um, Sometimes that's too late. Well, well, there's breath, there's still hope. One of the common characteristics with addiction is the propensity to take. We get taught how to be of service and to volunteer and give to others, and it doesn't come naturally to a lot of addicts and alcoholics. How do you find mentoring other people? Uh, how has it helped your recovery? A magical thing happens that when I um, try to help another addict through the steps and in support, I get off me. If you have a loved one who you know, is suffering from addiction, and it might take a long time to get them into um, treatment or to a meeting, but um, just not to give up. Is that what has been so important in your own recovery? Somebody not giving up on you? You know, it took me to lose everything um, and to end up, you know, homeless. But certainly once I um, was willing to reach out, it was amazing that I still had lots of friends and family who, who were there for me. And they're just waiting for you to reach out. That's right. In the depths of Australia's ice crisis, we uncover elements of hope. Today is a special day for one family ripped apart by ice. Tom is home for the first time in a year and begins a long road to recovery. So it's a celebration and it's a new start to his life. Because my son's moved out of a home that was a bad place and he's moving back in with my husband and I, um, start fresh. Every broken family that starts afresh has a daily battle to fight. As the drug spreads from cities to rural towns, Australia needs to overcome this ice age before it's too late.